Welcome to Influencers TV. I'm Rachel Means coming to you from the Crawford Media Group Studios. We're going to have a great show for you. Up first is Corner Cafe, sharing the story and heart of an artist. My co-host and I, Jamie Daniel, talk with artist Janet Swanson. After that, we have David Cooper and John D. Young back in studio from Front Range Christian School, and we talk about making cultural makers. Then Rachel Amade sits with her longtime friend, Ashley Elizabeth, to discuss health. Enjoy. About the things I worship you wrongly. Live to love, love to live. And welcome to Corner Cafe. Woohoo! This is where we share the story and heart of an artist and introducing a new artist. We have Janet Swanson with us. Welcome to Corner Cafe. Hey, I'm so excited to be with you guys today. Ooh, Janet, I love your energy. I like that. Yes. She's all and beautiful. Excited. I love that. Beautiful background too. Oh, um, I know, right? For our radio listeners, we do have videos up. If you just go to cornercaferadio.com, you can check mm -hmm. out the videos. Um, but Janet, we're going to listen to a song here, Sufficient for Today. Um, tell us about the song before we listen. Well, this is one of my favorite songs because it talks about whatever we're going through in life and whether we're grieving or whether we are hurting or we're um, suffering, any, any kind of suffering that we go through, that God is enough for us and He's going to help us through every trial that we go through. He is going to help us when our heart is broken. And that's, that's why I recorded this song is because Jesus is enough, and we don't have to keep looking mm. any further than Him. And He is our peace in the storm. And sometimes storms will come out of nowhere. Like, we're like, gosh, where did that come from? Yesterday was great, but today something just happened. And He's enough. So that's what it's all about. He's sufficient for today. Ooh, I love that. Amen. Mm. Well, let's take a listen to Sufficient for Today. Here it is. In the joy and in the sorrow, 
I find you just the same And behind my darkest mornings There's a peace I can't explain I'm so grateful for your favor Your mercy and your grace Is they go on forever They're sufficient for today sufficient for today one day I'll finally see you and my faith will be my sight and all my present sufferings will be gone and left behind I'll be standing sufficient for today hallelujah 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 is sufficient for today And that was sufficient for today on Corner Cafe. Love it. Yes. So we get so distracted and we think that mm-hmm. we need this or that and the other, um, you know, that this is going to make us happy. Is that kind of also uh, where the song came from? Well, um, actually, this is a song that Maverick City, they recorded it and I just did a cover for it. Um, but through the pandemic in 2020, um, so many people were... We, we did so many funerals in our church, and mm. so many people were dying that were close to us, people that we had prayed for, that we were believing for miracles and, and praying and hoping that they would pull through, but they didn't, and some of them did and some of them didn't. And this song just really ministered to me personally because whatever was happening and whatever was going on, God was enough, and He would bring us through the peace that He gives us will bring us through um, the pain, the disappointment. Like, you know, God, I really felt you were going to do it differently. I was not expecting that. And I I was disappointed, you know? Right. But um, He was enough. So in that trial and, and walking people through grief, through suicide, through um, sudden death, and it, it just, the list goes on and on. I can't even remember how many funerals we did within two years. Um, so that song, I just recorded it because um, I did a cover for it. It's just one of those songs that it says enough, like, mm-hmm. it's sufficient for today. And, you know, hallelujah is the highest praise that we can give God, and that's what the chorus is all about. Hallelujah is sufficient for today. Hallelujah, God, you're you're enough. And I don't need to look any further. 
And some things we won't understand until we get to heaven. You know, the Word says that we see through things through like a dim glass right now. We know in part, but we will know in full when we get to heaven. But there's some things that we won't understand. Some things we have to put on the shelf and say, God, I don't get that right now, but you do. I'm going to trust you in that, and I'm going to trust that you are enough for today, and you're enough for me, and and I don't have to have all the answers today. I just need you today, and you're enough. Amen. Amen, for sure. Um, So did I hear that you are a pastor? Yes, we pastored for um, 17 years in Statesboro, Georgia, and we just moved to Florida. So we're not pastoring. I'm on staff at a church, um, but we're not like the head pastors anymore. Um, my husband took a break for a little while. I think after all the funerals he did, he needed a little sabbatical. And um, but I am working on staff uh, in a church as the uh, music director. Oh, wow. church. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Now, Janet, uh, listening to your amazing voice, amazing uh, ministry that's coming out of you and your 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 husband and all the, the pastoring that you've done and just all the uh, the encounters of so many people that you've gone through um, what is the the testimony of that that pull that pulled you into a closer and deeper relationship with Jesus Christ you know, a testimony is not just what God has done for me, but it's what God continues to do for me. Amen. So my testimony is more than my past, but it's my present, and it's who I am becoming. Um, so through all the things that we've been through and all the trials that we face and even the disappointments, I have learned that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be no evil. Why? Because he's with me. He's with me, and he's enough. And he even goes to the extent to say, I'll, you know, I'll set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. You know, all these things that he will do for you. And, you know, you think of uh, the 23rd Psalm, that he's enough. Yeah. You know, he talks about the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. So through all of this, you know, we were shepherds over the church, but the Lord himself, Jesus, is our shepherd. Amen. And I have learned that um, through all that we went through and the testimony that came out of all of that is um, that Jesus knows what he's doing, Mm. and he has plans for the world. He has plans for us. He has plans for you and all of you that are listening. And sometimes we don't understand it because we can't wrap our carnal mind right. around what he's doing. But number one is, Lord, I trust you. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I love you and I trust you. So that has been my testimony. It's been that in my past. I've had to trust him every step of the way. And for my present. So right now, my testimony is, I don't get it, God, I don't understand it still, but I trust you. And one day we can look back on things and we'll go, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. But in the moment when you don't understand what you're going through and you prayed one thing, but God did a different thing, you have to trust him. Yeah. You know, it, where, as you were speaking, it, I felt like I ha- should have uh, like a Hammond B3 behind you. <laughs> I, can, <That'd> be great. <laughs> I can hear it every time. Brum, dun, right. dun. <laughs> wow, that is so powerful, Janet. And I know just just being married um, is a is a ministry by itself and then being in ministry and being married is powerful as well uh i just love your testimony i love how how you you just sequentially put the words in order that really speaks to the heart of all people and you you truly have a pastor's heart amen thank you thank you that means a lot it really does what do you feel is, um, you know, having that pastor's heart is something that's challenging. Um, we have a couple minutes here. Challenging right now in the culture that you love to speak to in mm-hmm. particular. Yeah. Um, well, in the culture that we're living in, everybody knows 
Jesus. They know about him, but they really don't know him. And the right. challenge to lead people to Christ has been, it's been difficult. It's been a challenge for me because everybody seems to know about him and they don't think they need any more of him. Um, but I see people living a lifestyle that is in contrary to who he is. And I have to really ask the Lord, how, how do I deal with that? Because, you know, 20 years ago, people were like, yeah, I don't know the Lord, and I've been living out in the world, and yeah, I'm, I'm apart from Him. But now it's like, no, I love the Lord, but I'm sleeping with my boyfriend, and I'm smoking weed on the weekend. Right. So, yeah, how, how do you deal with that? And yeah. when people come in, I mean, we, we were pastors for so long, and we counsel with people, and I saw little by little by little throughout the years this taking place, where many years ago, let's just say 20 years ago, it wasn't like that. Right. People, they knew what was wrong. They understood, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm living in sin right now. This is wrong. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Right. But maybe one day I'll get back with God, but right now I'm not there. But now everybody's walking with God and everything's okay. And it's okay to live a sinful lifestyle, and, and God's okay with it. Yeah. Mm, good and point. If you, and if you say okay. something against it, then they call you haters. Mm -hmm. Right. No, yep. I'm not hating you. I'm loving you. I'm, you know, so yeah, you have to be real careful, and you have to be discerning, and you have to have a heart for them. I've learned this. I don't do anything unless I see the Holy Spirit working, and then I just join Him with what He's doing. Amen. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, Very that's good. great. Yep, mm -hmm. and it's just great you're doing music, getting the gospel out. The real gospel, not the gospel that yeah. we come to Jesus and we can do whatever we want, or he's going to be our sugar down. daddy, or yeah. yeah, the watered down gospel for <laughs> sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we've loved um, hearing hearing your testimony, uh, hearing your music. We're going to play a future song um, in, in our shows as well. Yeah. More of your music, is what I should say. But I'm going to transition before we end the segment to our Expresso question, which is Express. express Yourself. yourself and the question is um what childhood um commercial jingle do you remember <laughs> what childhood commercial jingle do you remember and i'll just kind of start off with one if it even counts as a jingle <laughs> just so you can think um you know frosted flakes they're oh great my gosh, yeah. <laughs> i mean i remember yeah, that yeah, Tony the tiger <laughs> yeah it might be still be the same <laughs> yes yes so for me it's Mabalone has a first name. Oh my it's gosh, that's true. Mabalone <laughs> has a second name. It's M-A-Y-E-R-O. I love to read it every day. And if you ask me what I'll say, Oscar Mayer has a way with B-O-L-O-G-N-A. That is so good. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. We just asked the <laughs> right espresso question for you because you, you sang the whole thing. That was awesome. <laughs> Janet, you were all over that like an yeah. Oscar Mayer sandwich. Yeah, you were all over that one. That's very good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that was deep in my spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what sticks to us as we were when we were coming up kids because we're adults now and the the you know like the the commercials or the jingle that just sticks with us. Right. That is so funny. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just yeah. impressed because I Frosted Flakes they're great, but you I mean you guys mm -hmm. had the everything. Did you sing um that when you were a kid too? Did you get all excited about that song? Oh, how cute. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Jen, like, I've never had a bologna sandwich in my life. I love that song, though. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we, we ate bologna a lot, let me tell you. Right. <laughs> that commercial just, yeah, it ministered to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, it was um, just uh, very precious getting to know you, and we've had Absolutely. a really good time. We'll keep in touch. We'll have you back on the Corner Cafe sharing the story and heart of an artist. Stay tuned. Thank you. When Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago, he had some pretty revolutionary ideas. Looking back on it, it's easy to side with him now. But if you'd been there, would you have been such a supporter? Things that make you go, hmm, your Crawford Broadcasting Company, God and Country Station. Here are a few things for you to think about. Our money says in God we trust. Do you? We have freedom of religion, but do you take time to exercise it? We are one nation under God. If you don't love it, feel free to leave it. You can't pray in schools today, but you can pray for them. Hit your knees today. 
They can take prayer out of schools, but they can't remove God from our hearts. Just a few things to think about. In the book of Job, we read about a man whose faith is put to the ultimate test. Job is struck with physical pain and ultimately loses everything, including his family. Yet his faith remains strong. How are you doing today with tests of your faith? Things that make you go, hmm. Your Crawford Broadcasting Company, God and Country Station. And welcome back. We have David Cooper and John DeYoung in studio. Hey, guys, we've been having a really good conversation these past couple of weeks. I mean, I could talk for hours <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with yeah, David. Um, so I, I really enjoy this conversation. But um, for today's show, we're going to talk about being a, a culture maker. And one of the things I was saying um, before we started this segment is you got to You know, you're training the kids up in the way in which they should go. You're preparing them. You're giving them critical thinking skills. You're giving giving them a high education Mm -hmm. so that when they go into the university and then go into the society as a whole, they're prepared. But it's not only education, though. It's also the... um, the opposition they're going to face because nowadays quite frank frank you're going to face opposition if you believe in these type of ideals Mm -hmm. that we're talking about being christians so how do you um prepare that wow yeah i think it is first and foremost you can't prepare a kid for that if you have a a convent style education Right. right. There used to be a time where we want to send kids to Christian school and they would be protected. We're going to put them in this right. nice little bubble and we're not going to let the world touch and we're not going to <laughs> right. we're not going to look at anything that's controversial. And that that fails. Right. Yeah. Kids get out of that and they they haven't argued with the or wrestled with the hard topics and right. hard questions. And so instead of being a, a bubble, we need to be an incubator. Exactly. And we need to be connected to the world and and involved in it and taking on hard topics. We've we've got to talk about slavery and injustice and we've got to talk about those things and wrestle with them, right. but do it in a context where we've got great men and women of God they're going to guide that dialogue and that discovery. Mm-hmm. And if you can do that, then they leave our school and they don't get upended. Right. when they get hit with those arguments because they've already engaged in that thought. They've already wrestled with that hard question. Yeah. And so they're ready for it. Right. right? I love Did, that. And, I'll, and, I'll, and I want to, John has something to say here, um, but real quick, I'll never forget this. Before I went to CU Boulder, hmm. um, McDonald's with my dad having, I don't know, I probably had chicken nuggets because I love them. <laughs> so, um, but this lady overheard our conversation about me going to see you Boulder and she was very concerned and, and mm-hmm. she turned to my dad and she said, I sent my daughter to see you Boulder and she totally, and we're Christian and she left the faith, mm-hmm. you know, and just in shock and you could just, it was sad, you know, and so, but me being, hearing that and um, being prepared anyways, just because my u- unique personality, I was, I had already wrestled with a lot of stuff thankfully you yeah. know um but i didn't have the um the option of this wonderful school mm. either and so you hear this story over and over again i sent my my kid to college and they're no longer christians you know um and i think that that is because they just weren't they were in a bubble <laughs> like yeah. you had said sure i think for me i was blessed my dad a brilliant man and an educator and strong faith oh my gosh uh, and One of the hallmarks of being raised by him was there was no question that was out of bounds. And I I never got a response to a question with Mm. some type of uh, dogmatic answer. It was always asking me another question Mm. about what I was saying and forcing me to think and to to delve deeper into the why of what I was asking or thinking. And and that's driven me as an educator. Uh, And I think as Christian parents, we tend to want to correct the bad thinking, right? By yeah, saying, we're this trying is to protect you... them, but we're not giving them skills. That's correct. We yeah. say that's bad thinking and this is how you should think. And right. instead we need to, we need to stick to those things, but we need to walk them through that process of understanding why is that the right answer? Right. And that, that means being willing to have some uncomfortable dialogues with our own children. Yeah. And yeah. I think some of that is just, um, on the parents part, maybe just fear, or maybe oh. they're not, I'm not, I'm a mathematician, I'm not a scientist, and it's just maybe fear that hmm. I don't know how to explain my 
faith within that context, you know. But yeah. if you have like your dad, he was brilliant educator, so he had the um, the ability and the gifting to do that. But for the parent that doesn't have that kind of ability, because not all parents know how to do that, so I sure. think that's sometimes why. Yeah. But then, thankfully, with your school, you know, yeah. well, the, that, the kids learn. That's why you need to partner with a Christian school. Exactly. Right? Because I have these amazing teachers that that is their gifting right. in their subject area. And I'm not an expert in all those fields. Um, but I really enjoy engaging in those conversations with those who are. Right. It's beautiful. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. One of the things I uh, love about um, what the teachers or what the you know, community of Front Range is, is that the, the children we interviewed and the families we interviewed talked about this specifically and that it helped the way that the, the students saw it is they, they, they could see truth, they could have critical thinking around it, have good conversations, and then it strengthened them and what mm-hmm. their belief was, right? right? And so, and what's really awesome is, you know, even as a parent, like, yeah, you know, my wife's a counselor, so she kind of counsels people how you have these sort of conversations with kids, and you're never too late. Mom and dad, you're never too <laughs> late. Get in there, and, and it's okay to have, to stumble a little bit in the beginning, but mm-hmm. yeah. when, when I interviewed the family, the teachers, and the students there, there there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, physical, spiritual, mental strengthening that happens in this school that's super unique and it, and, it, and, and and no one's fabricating it. Like right. the the fifth grader d- could, can't fabricate what he's what, <laughs> right. he's what he's telling me and the mom is, and the parents are like saying, hey, this is what we experience here. Now it's not yeah. a perfect school, but mm. goodness gracious, here's a school that's actually like, hey, come in, we're gonna invite you and wrestling with some of these questions is right. how you strengthen those muscles those ligaments and those tendons. If you just take the athlete that doesn't want to wrestle or the child that doesn't want to wrestle with these things and just put them to the side, like you were saying, like a convent, mm-hmm. well, the muscles just yeah. disappear. Right. Atrophy. Right. Atrophy. Exactly. Right. And so I think this is a place where kids can really not only get excellent college prep education, but man, they get to wrestle and it's right. cool. Right. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I love that. Once again, um, I just want to be enrolled in school again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it. I, <laughs> I won't tell you about my high school. <laughs> did you go, actually, John? I did, okay. but what I discovered was that the te- some of the teachers were there just to be there, mm. and I just became really good friends with them, mm. and that worked out really well for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can slip in an A if you want. Yeah. yeah that, it's playing to your strengths, John. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so have you found, as um, you know, people have graduated, got, gone on to college, and now they're adults, um, mm. some of those, uh, I'm sure you've kept in touch with some of them, or some of the teachers have, any stories of a partic- particular student now as a, a cultural maker. Um, <laughs> culture. That's hard, that's hard to say. Yeah. Culture maker. <laughs> yeah, I think we, I'm trying to think of a specific example, um, and I don't have one readily off the top of my head. You kind of caught me off guard with that. Um, but we do. We, we've had a number of graduates have gone on, those that have chosen to go into areas like music, and instead of just find their way into the machine that is that industry, they've decided to, to make their own mark and yeah. do it in a way that's glorifying to God. Uh, we have them that are in Washington, D.C. right now. Woohoo, we need that. Oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. They're, they're <laughs> interning for senators and they are trying to position themselves so that they can become people of influence, but do it in a manner that is honoring to their Savior. Amen. Um, and they're, they're continuing that pursuit. Yeah, that's so. beautiful. That is beautiful. Um, so when you just kind of going back with your life journey, mm-hmm. um, with being a part of this amazing school, and obviously your dad was an educator, did you ever think that you would be a part of something so beautiful within the educational system? Wow. <laughs> um, no, I don't think I did. Um, I began in, in public school 16 years as a teacher, coach, and administrator, and left because... I was sitting in my office uh, about to hand out a suspension to a young man whose dad I had on speed dial, and we were on a first-name basis. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to suspend him again for I don't know how many time it was, and I realized this kid doesn't need to be suspended. 
what this kid needs is a transformation mm. and mm. he needs me to be able to open up the word of God that's and good. share with him the hope that's in the gospel right. to pray for him, to lay my hands on him and say, you know what, if you can give your life to Christ now, this can change yeah. and his um. mind can be renewed and his heart softened. And it was at that moment I realized I needed to get back to Christian education, Come but on. I had left Christian education because it wasn't what I was envisioning. And I was at uh, several really good schools before I got to Front Range Christian School. And this is the first time where my vision for Christian education has come closer to fruition. Wow. And I'm seeing the pieces of it um, become a part of the fabric of our school. Wow. And, and I think a big one, big piece of that is creation, creating culture makers for Christ. Right. What well, we want individuals that aren't just going to consume, critique, and condemn culture. They need to go out there and engage it. Right. And and be purposeful about redeeming it for Christ. Amen. Yeah. What a beautiful vision that the Lord gave you um, mm. and a unique way to do school in which we should be doing school. Um, and I think I, so. And you mentioned in the last show, too, that you're not just, you know, keeping this within your school here. You're mm. sharing this this knowledge with other schools. Um, do you have any examples of that, of how you shared with another school and you, you see their culture changing in that regard? And specifically, mm. I want to ask this question because we talked about on a couple episodes about being in a Christian bubble and then we don't um, share how to think differently, right? And then I kind of caught that perhaps in some of the other Christian schools that you were involved in, maybe that was kind of the case in, in a sense, perhaps not. But how do you, when you talk to these other schools, really encourage them, hey, this is really working. They're learning critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And as they've applied that, have you seen that culture shift within that school? Yes, we have. Uh, and whether it's been a culture shift it's been at least an adoption of some of those practices, yeah. right? We see that, and it's we have a full special needs program called our Rise program. Aww. We're about the only one in Colorado, I believe, that that does what we do. We've had multiple schools come, take a look at our program, take notes. We give them everything we have and say, go, launch those programs. We've had teachers come in to watch our academic dialogues. And then they've taken the units that have been developed by those teachers back to their school to implement it into their classrooms. So we have seen those things happen. And we hear stories. We hear back from those teachers often. I can't believe it. It's I, why did it take so long right, <laughs> right, for this to happen in my classroom right. that I didn't realize that I could teach Romeo and Juliet and make it look this way or the American Revolution and truly talk about the, the lofty essential questions in a way that, that's meaningful to kids. Right. So we've heard those things. Now, whether that's brought a culture change to those schools, that's a big that's a high bar. Yeah. Right? Um, it took a while for us to get to that place yeah. as a school. Yeah, and I was just thinking when you were talking, just kind of using those examples, um, that would help me as a kid and even as an adult um, to take the material, not just reading it in the textbook and then quizzing, mm -hmm. but then talking about it and making it my own. Mm -hmm. It would help me to remember better. Yeah. Oh, it does. Uh, that That's the amazing part. That our kids create... Th their ability to retain a lot of that information and knowledge uh, increases certainly, but it's not just that, it's their ability to then manipulate it. Right. Right. And, and I not, I don't mean manipulation in a bad way, but right. to, uh, as if it's a, it's, it's a, it's a toy they can use as they're in conversation with right. people because it is connected, not just to regurgitation, right. but to a moment in time where they were having to remember it to bring up a topic in a conversation. Yeah. And, and that, that hooks it into the memory in a different way and in a deeper way. Yeah. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'm going to be real candid. I mean, just going through school, it was like just remembering this facts so I can mm. pass the test. As soon as the yep. test is over, delete. <laughs> I yeah. was like, I can't retain anything. Yeah, we but, only studied to the test. You only exactly. study to the test and once you get on, whatever. Yeah. But, I mean, if kids are, in, you know, if the kids are, active in their learning yeah. mm -hmm. and they're active in their uh, critical thinking and then being able to 
apply it to themselves, go up and down on it, see the different views, right. and then have a conversation around it, and then learn from that conversation, right. mm-hmm. and then let that transformation slowly go. I mean, that's that's really, that's critical nowadays, because like you were saying, everyone's getting stupider, and <laughs> because we're just yelling at everyone, and you're like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm making decisions out of fear or not offending, and then suddenly I'm going to adopt an idea or ideology not to offend? Wait a minute, hold on. Yeah. yeah. Hold on, that you know, and, and so to be able to be in a system or a school that's like, hey, listen, here's what this is what this is, and this is what the left hand is saying, this is what the right hand is saying. Let's put them together. What do you think about that? Mm-hmm. Right. How are you going to apply that? And what is, and how does God? Right. Where is God in all of this? Because you know, there there that is as well. So here's this direct north. It's north, mm-hmm. and education has been farting around, excuse my French, <laughs> and going one degree off every single year, and then right. you're going to find yourself not at the peak, you're totally in a different valley, and you're yeah. like, wait a minute, how did I get here? Yeah. 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 Really good point. Um, and also, you know, just the concern uh, is we're trying to be competitive with other nations, <laughs> and um, I, I don't I don't stay up to date on, you know, the statistics, um, but if we could talk real quick real quick about that about you know china and their scores and mm-hmm. russia and their scores and um as the educational system is dropping not of course in your concern but in, in general in, with the united states what's it going to look like you know 20 years from now um mm-hmm. as as we can't compete with these with these other nations with education is this something that you consider and, and ponder it certainly is but i guess i want us to step back a little bit because education has become so enamored with test scores. Mm, Good point. That's how we're evaluating whether someone has attained a level of scholarship that we want them to attain. Yeah, and I and I just admit I would just study for the test and then I forget <laughs> everything. So it didn't that, really do me good. <laughs> that's exactly right. Just because you get a great score on a test or on the ACT or the SAT or whatever yeah. standardized test you want to use to compare us to, yeah. it doesn't mean you know how to think. Right. Mm. And right. that's what we're that's what we're chasing. Right. Because if we can chase that and we can create people that are deeply, richly educated, educated and know how to think right. and have the eloquence to communicate that knowledge, right. I have no fear of where we will be as a society, if we can create those people. Yes. I, I, do I care about scores? Yeah, I'm an educator, we love our data. And we track data. It's what we do to try to perfect some of what we do in our instruction and our, our curriculum at our school. Mm-hmm. But is that the driver, is that the end goal? Absolutely not, right. it is not our target. Yeah. Our target is to create kids who think well and think deeply about meaningful questions. Yeah. And we need to do that by by engaging with texts and information that are valuable. Right. Yeah, it's just a whole kind of revamp. And, and I'm relieved, you know, because um, the model that we have in that degree is not proving anything, as mm-hmm. you had just mentioned. And then we're not creating adults who, um, although they could have been straight A students, maybe not so great in their adult life and their work in their career because <laughs> mm, yeah, you know they they learned how to be a student but they didn't really learn how to think like yeah. you're saying and and, and they're going to become yeah. better parents they become good thinkers oh right. my goodness yes they're going to become better <laughs> parents so that's right. and now we we've, we've added another i think variable that's causing problems for us and that is uh, it in our society and particularly in in education we don't want kids to fail so we're going to create a system that's so <laughs> soft that they can't mm, fail. Right. And what we need to create is a culture in a school, and this is what we pursue at ours, where we want you to take risks. Mm-hmm. Failure is not something to fear. Right. It's something to embrace and learn from. Mm-hmm. Not that we have kids that we don't have kids failing algebra one. Right. But, <laughs> but we want them striving for things and they're mm-hmm. going to come up short. They're yeah. going to push themselves and come up short. And, we're so afraid of kids coming up short. We don't want them to feel bad. We're right. going to give them a juice box, an orange <laughs> slice, and a you know a trophy. Yeah, yeah. and no then matter. when you're when you're an adult, you're like, "Where's my juice box?" Yes, yeah. that's, that's exactly <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and, and you know what? No failure needs to be a part of what we face. Yeah, uh, but we need to embrace it in the right way. Yeah, otherwise yeah. we we create 
weak, flaccid people instead of resilient, strong ones. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I love this conversation. Box well, that up and pass yeah. it around to every school right there. Amen. <laughs> well, having a great conversation with yeah. David Cooper and John DeYoung. We're going to um, end it now, but we're going to be coming up on a future show and continuing the conversation. So stay tuned. Love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Who is God to you? Who is God to us? Is he boring? Old? Irrelevant? Is he real? Is he powerful? We tell ourselves, God is nothing more than words on a page. His power isn't real. He's small, weak, and insignificant. He doesn't understand my daily struggle. To us, he's absent, lifeless, dead. Is this truly God's character? Is he weak? Is he absent? Does God still exist? Is he real? God is more. He is more than a line or a passage. His power is not confined to words penned by man. It's real. From his mouth, the universe came to be. He is more than talk. He is action. He is by our side. He understands our pain, our struggle. Mere words cannot describe the warmth of his embrace or the shelter that he brings. He is more. I am so excited to bring you guys a really special guest today and someone who I've known since we were like little, little children. <laughs> we played together. <laughs> um, our, our moms were best friends. And it just so happens that she has um, just kind of an incredible resume of research and education in the areas of health and wellness that I've been trying to discuss with you all now for a little while. Her name is Ashley Elizabeth, and she has a master's in counseling. She also is going to be starting a ministry called Exalt Family Ministries. Um, she's working on setting this up. This is going to be resources and advocacy uh, in the health realm, which I think we really need. We really need more options. We really need more wisdom in that and um, more people speaking into that for us. So I'm excited. Thank you, Ashley, for being here. Of course. Thank you it's for having me. So fun. I don't get to catch up with you very often. Um, but seriously, like, I feel like I've just, I've known your face and you look the same as you did <laughs> when you were young, <laughs> I've known your face for so long, um, and your family and you have such an incredible family, such an incredible testimony, um, so many godly people in your family. And so I think it's not at all surprising that God puts you into the health realm in one way, shape or form given the times that we're in. And I think God is calling more and more people to discuss this because we have been learning so much about what's happened to our medical establishment in the last few years. And people seem to be kind of off. They don't seem to be healthy mentally, psychologically, spiritually, physically, just not healthy. So we're going to have a good discussion today, but I want to start with, um, the viewers and listeners. I think they'd really just like to know more about who you are the ministry you're working on and your story. How did you get to this place? What, what brought you here? Oh, well, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it quick. Um, so I, I'm a Colorado native and um, we, I, I'm the oldest of four um, in my family. So I'm a bit of a type A personality, like take charge. Um, yeah, right. That's why we, that's why we get along. <laughs> only only firstborns understand first. Born. That's right. We understand each uh, other. <laughs> but I um, so I went to school at CU. I played soccer, um, and it was really interesting. I was thinking about this, like, wow, I soccer was like growing up, like my identity. And when I was done with my undergrad and soccer was over, I was like, what am I supposed to do with myself? Mm -hmm. um, my parents would joke that I had like a, a year or so of like just 
finding myself. And yeah. I worked at Bubba Gump Shrimp Company with a oh, friend. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that place. It, yo, yeah. <laughs> downtown Denver. It was not my finest moment. Because I, I wasn't even a waitress. I was a hostess because I had never worked in the restaurant business. So I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but within like that year or so of just like figured out like, what is my life going to look like in my future? And um, I decided to go back to school. I went to CU Denver um, and got a master's in counseling because I just have, I always had a heart for helping others. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to work with kids uh, my undergrad was in speech pathology, mm-hmm. um, but I, that just wasn't quite fitting where I wanted to go. So um, I did my master's in counseling. I absolutely loved it. It was um, their program there is amazing. It's like took me about two and a half, three years because um, it's a it's a pretty intense program. Mm-hmm. I got to do a practicum in a um, elementary school in Thornton, which was so oh my gosh, so eye opening and just yeah. like how different worlds are just in within our state and like the things that these young kids were going through, like sixth graders yeah. um, was just, it was crazy. And I, I did um, some work in a high school as well. And then just really realized like, wow, if I work in a school, I don't really get the chance to work with kids and like on mental health. It was more counselors these days in schools are more geared towards like scheduling and, let's see what you want to do with college. Like there's a little bit of um, mental health talk. You know, we talked about like bullying and things like that, but it wasn't like getting into the weeds and really being an advocate for kids. And that's kind of where my heart was. And um, so I didn't actually, I didn't actually like go into it as a career. Um, Even though I have my master's in that, I ended up working totally separate in oil and gas because I had just like had a friend that got me into it while I was doing school and it worked. And right. um, so I, I did that for about 10 years and then, had, you know, got married. I now have four kids um, that are seven, five, three, and one. Mm. I have three boys. And then our little last one was a girl and she's just been so fun this last oh, year. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think becoming a mother also has really like it jump starts you into like, oh my goodness, who's in charge of our family and their mm-hmm. health? And it, you know, I felt personally like it weighed on me. And mm-hmm. um, as their parent and their mother, and it was really important to me to just um, be able to not only for myself to know, but for them to be able to teach them um, the importance of taking care of yourself and that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and what yeah. are called to you know, treat it like a temple. Um, and I think in America, at least we, we don't really look at it that way. We're kind of think we're invincible. Like we have everything, everything's fine here. It's safe. You know, we kind of outsource our health to others, um, Mm -hmm. and we don't take responsibility for it. And, um, so yeah, I, I think too, um, a bigger part of my story that really, um, has shaped me into like becoming more of a researcher is about what gosh now is it four years I I don't yeah. like counting these years because um my dad so five years ago on Father's Day weekend um drove himself to the hospital didn't tell any of us he had been having some weird symptoms and we came to find out he drove himself to a high hospital um St. Joe's downtown and because he thought he was having a stroke it's not ideal if you're having a stroke to be driving yourself, no. but, um, he went in, they didn't think he did, but he, my grandma, his mother had had several strokes and died from a stroke slash heart attack. And so I think that was just always in the back of his head. Like I have family history of this. So they yeah. kind of appeased him. We're like, well, you're not showing signs of a stroke, but like, we'll do a CT just to double check. And the call that we all got, my mom, my sister, my brother and I, uh, brothers and I, um, the next call was that he, they found a a mass in his brain Hmm. um, and we needed to immediately go to the hospital. So the whirlwind of that was he ended up being diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is a very um, stage four, immediate um, grade four, very aggressive cancer in his brain. 
Um, he was only 56 when he was diagnosed. So very, very young and not a lot of symptoms or signs that like would have said, Oh, I think you have a brain tumor. Like it was very subtle that really only he noticed, but thank God he went and got checked. Right. But none of us knew, like we never, we didn't know he was having like symptoms of something. And so it was a, sh- a complete shock. Shocking. Oh, it's complete shock. Like, you know, yeah. your dad, we're really all, our family's really close. And, um, my dad is like my, he was our rock. Like we, we yeah. used to joke, he was the godfather of the family. Like what he <laughs> said, what, like you didn't cross dad. Um, but in the most lovey way, like he just like, took oh, care he of was, us all. Yeah, oh, yeah, he was awesome. I remember yeah. him very well. He's a great man. Yeah. yeah. So he, you know, throughout that, his diagnosis, um, he went through chemo and radiation. Um, but I was kind of the, me and my sister, Brittany, we were, we ended up just like diving into research and we were like, we're going to figure this out. And we want to like help him as much as possible because I think that was just our heart. Like our dad did everything for us. And so this was like the smallest thing we could do was to be there and help him and just like walk alongside him in this and my mom. Um, Long story short, he only made it about 13 months before he passed away, Um, which is, I mean, they give you 12 to 18. So 13 was just right in there. And we were really praying and um, believing in God for a miracle, but we also knew like, it's God's will. And, um, we were really trying to align with that, but in a sense, same sense of like, we don't believe we're just going to sit back and wait. Like God gave us brains. He gave us resources. He gave us, you know, um, so much that we need to, we felt, we personally felt we needed to be active participants in his health and treatment plan, um, as well as like our family as a whole. So, Mm. um, And I think one of the, as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking, you know, one of the things that really, I think, spurred us on, all of us, um, my brothers included, was my dad's first meeting with his oncologist um, was literally two days after he had brain surgery. So he got diagnosed the Friday of Father's Day weekend, had brain surgery that Monday. um, And then two days later, he was out of ICU um, with a huge cut in his head uh, and just kind of processing at that point, we hadn't really, well, we knew the diagnosis, but he didn't. Right. So they had told us the diagnosis. Um, but we were meeting with his oncologist for the very first time. He's like on steroids, um, just got, of, got out of ICU and the oncologist walks in and tells us what the diagnosis is or tells him mostly and we're all in there with him. And then she hands him a piece of paper that is a Google printout of what a glioblastoma is. And I'm kind of like, oh, Google? We're Googling this. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're an thing. oncologist. This yeah. should be way more official than yeah, this. Like, I thought we didn't yeah. Google things. But sorry, my voice is, I'm just coming off of like a laryngitis thing. So if I squeak, okay. I apologize. Um, <laughs> no but, you know, and in the, in the midst of her talking and explaining to him, and he's just shocked, you know, obviously, right. um, he's trying to process, but he just had brain surgery. So he's a little slow to like figure this all out. And she looks at him and, she, and I'm asking questions. We're kind of all asking about like, what's the pre-treatment plan? And, and so wait, she, so I, I want to get the timeline straight. So he goes in. And they just admitted him to the hospital. Then? Oh, yeah. Is that what happened? Oh, and yeah. then they, they operated on the cancer within a few days Yes, and he still didn't know at that well, point. No. So they knew he had a mass, but they didn't know if it was cancer. Um, it could have been benign. They okay. Just, and so until they go in and, and the reason they would have done it sooner because it was such a large mass, um, but it was the weekend. And so to get a surgery team together, like a brain surgery team, right. pretty intense. Well, that to... seems pretty quick, actually. Oh, yeah. Like, so, well, it, like if he had gone in on a Wednesday or something, they probably would have done surgery the next day. Really? Um, yeah. But okay. because he had gone in on a Friday afternoon, you know, they had Saturday, Sunday, which actually, you know, I'm grateful for because we got to spend that those two days with him. Um, mm-hmm. It was hard, really hard. But we got to be with him and... Um, you know, 
I'll go back to this, but we, we talk about my family that we lost my dad twice. One mm. was his diagnosis. And after his brain surgery, he was not the same person. Ever I'm sure. Again. And yeah. then we lost him like when he passed away. So, um, we at least got those two days before to just kind of spend time together, pray, be together as a family. Um, now what happened surgery. to him after the brain surgery? So he, um, they ended up doing radiation for okay. I think six weeks on his brain, which is not easy oh, to wow. do. No. And then he did chemo for about, gosh, I don't even know how many months it was, a you know, several rounds of chemo, um, that made him very ill and it was kind of just their standard of care they didn't really have any, much to offer um so i have to say we ended up not using the oncologist we met in the hospital we transferred to a different oncologist because we just were not impressed with her the first thing she said was do you need anti an antidepressant do you want me to give you an antidepressant <laughs> And I'm sitting in the room. I'm like, he just had brain surgery. And she's like, you seem depressed. And I'm like, you just told him he has a like terminal brain cancer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I had an absolute blast chatting with my friend, Ashley. You can catch this full interview at Influencers TV YouTube. You can also catch this full interview and others at rachelay.substack.com. That is the spiritual exercises on Substack. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in for this edition of Influencers TV. We want to remind you that we are listener supported. If you feel led to give, just go to our website, cornercaferadio.com and click on the donate tab. And as always, we want to remind you that the greatest impact you can have is an influence for Jesus Christ. Until next time.